now I'm going to transition to the the last part, which is about future ready skills. And future ready skills um, is borrowing from some of the the work that comes out of Toronto, um, the Ontario Institute Studies for Education, Michael Fullen as well. He talks about the six C's of 21st century skills. Um, so what are these six C's, you might ask? Like, uh, there's some other iterations where there's four, but I think having the, the six is a little bit more comprehensive, and I agree with uh, Fullen uh, in this particular case. So the, the six C's are creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, communication, citizenship, and character. <laughs> so that might be a little bit uh, too much. So what I'll do is let me let me break it up for you, uh, and then I will I'll break up each one and then explain just briefly about what I mean by those, okay? So when we're talking about creativity, I feel like I, I always start with this one because it's probably one of the most important skills and one of the hardest ones for an AI to copy. Because when we have creativity, actually all of the other skills follow. Um, I believe the new revised Bloom's taxonomy actually uses this exact term. They, they say that like at the very top of the hierarchy of understanding is creativity. Because if you can be creative, you, you're creating something new. You've already got all the other ones. You've got critical thinking. You've got being able to communicate ab uh, about it. Uh, you have all the other aspects. And so I like that. You know, it's a good way of thinking about, uh, about it. And so what is creativity? Um, for me, creativity is is a type of self-expression. So it's being able to remix ideas and context um, and being able to express yourself. Like it, it's kind of, it's a form of self-expression. Uh, and that's why I often say like homework that is worth doing is often homework that involves self-expression of some sort. It, it's creative in some way. So like homework that is super boring would be just a bunch of um, say math worksheets that you, you just have to keep on doing um, and they have no no form of self-expression whatsoever uh, versus a math one might be oh I'm, I'm really into pirates so I'm going to create my own pirate map or pirate treasure hunt that involves a bunch of math puzzles and like that can be uh, another way of learning the same material but one has a lot of creative expression and then the other is kind of straight up like just doing the, the rote examples and so I feel that creativity is one of the places where there's lots and lots of opportunity uh, for growth. And I would love to see a lot more creativity uh, becoming a core part of the way in which we instruct. And in order to do this, uh, obviously, we need a lot of flexibility. And so it's one of the reasons when it comes to curriculum, any type of curriculum, uh, it's very valuable for us to support more uh, freedom, more flexibility. Uh, one thing that we, one of the big lessons I would say from being the school council chair at St. Isidore was that flexibility is so important whenever you're dealing with anything at scale. I mean, we had 5,700 students um, in there. So it, it was roughly the size of 10 uh, 10 regular, like, K to 9 uh, schools, like the population. And so it was very difficult to be extremely prescriptive, like, oh, everybody's got to do one thing. And so we always focused on giving people many choices. So if we did a wilderness activity, we never just did one option. Like, everybody must do a run. It wouldn't work for that many students because there's so many different age groups there's so many different people. So we had to give several different options and even with those options we had to give different levels. So there was like a like different types of badges that people could earn like um, beginner, me, uh, like intermediate and expert types of badges. So those types of uh, flexibility and those options was very important especially when you're, you're giving something that's supposed to work for a lot of people. And I, I love that, right? So because it is in like it is hard to work with just a blank slate. A blank piece of paper, just go make something, is much harder than saying, hey, make something about this framework. So 
giving flexibility and structure um, is a big part of any type of curriculum is like, how are you supporting flexibility and how are you supporting structure at the same time uh, is a big part of being able to be effective in this space. And so the more flexible we are, you know, in general, the the easier it's going to be uh, for educators to tailor the curriculum to the interests of kids or to their own passions and their own interests. And I feel that like that's a big part of like flexibility. Like teacher autonomy is something that is measured by the OECD as as beneficial uh, for education. That's why they that's why they measure it. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next one. So collaboration. So what do we mean by collaboration? Um, so we might be thinking like, oh, well, this just means group projects or something. Uh, you know what? We don't. It's it's not just about doing uh, group projects, because I I know we've all had this experience, right? Like, <laughs> you know, you you have one person who does the entire group project, and everybody just like sits and watches. Um, one of my favorite books oh, I should probably add that to the stream um, is um, Extreme Ownership uh, by Jacob. Uh, Wallink, I think. And in in this book of extreme ownership, they talk about how it's about taking like collaboration is very much kind of like a an aspect of citizenship. We're taking ownership for things that you may not originally feel responsible for. That's what being part of a really great team is. And so I would love for our children to experience that type of collaboration. One where we're not just doing the absolute minimum that we need, and we call that collaboration. One where we are all like contributing above and beyond our posts, above and beyond what can be done. And having ways that we can recognize and celebrate those types of things uh, is very important. So when I look at collaboration, I just look at the experts, right? Like who are the, who are the experts in, I don't know, it could be even like our police forces or in the... Um, uh, in the Canadian military, who are like the experts at talking about collaboration, working in a team. I feel like they have a lot that they can teach us about collaboration. And the more that we can incorporate these different types of learning experience, the more we can see how important it is uh, for for our lives. And it becomes a skill where it, it, it's going to become a critical skill because uh, as we move further, things get more complicated. It becomes harder to to build things. You need teams. You can't get stuff done just on your own. You need to be working with a large number of people um, in order to to get them. And they have to have. They're going to have very different perspectives. They're going to have very different views. And so I see that as like a big a big part of like how do you work in a team? How do you ensure that people feel um, heard? How how do we make sure that all the best ideas are there, or we encourage people to participate. Uh, I think the same principles also apply to education as well. You know, education is a collaborative thing. We don't have one person doing uh, all of it. Being able to incorporate the this notion of we're we're all partners <laughs> in, in the learning. Like, who are we collaborating with? Well, we're collaborating with the students. We're you know, getting them to participate or getting them to write stuff down. When um, we write things in the comments, we want them to be active participants, not passive listeners. Uh, then we're modeling collaboration uh, and how it is in the real world because it's not you just like sit there and we expect you to just listen. Um, employers aren't really paying you to just listen. They're, they're paying you to also participate. And so what does active participation mean? And what does it mean to just not continue unless we, we do have participation. So I think that collaboration, I can go on and on about that, but it, it's a, another one that people say is more and more important. It, this is what, like, don't take my word for it, just uh, listen to the experts in this case. Uh, they're saying that this is something that is very important uh, for a future-ready skill. Uh, the next one I'll talk about is critical thinking. So 
I like, uh, like, so I've already spoken to critical thinking. And the, the way, the reason I mentioned Bill Nye um, was because, like, I heard him during the site uh, conference, uh, California IT and Education Conference. Um, and the, this is what he said, like, was the most important skill. And I can understand, like, he's a scientist, right? Like, he's, he comes from uh, that type of background. And so he, like, critical thinking is very much like scientific thinking. And so it's about doing those small experiments. And it, in, if you think about it, like it's very similar to computational thinking. It's very similar to design thinking. There are elements of you know critical thinking in many different aspects, like subjects that we do, especially in science. So I, I do think, yeah, computational thinking in in science, that, like that makes sense. That's that's where it should be. I think that really when it comes to the skill of developing. Um, critical thinking, it has to start with curiosity. And again, I'm going to go back to creativity because creativity is about being curious. It's about not accepting things the way that they are. And so if we develop students that are critical or they're, they're kind of thinking, well, what if we did it this other way? I don't know. Go and try it out. Like, you tell me what happens. We are going to develop um, kids that are going to push the boundaries that are going to be very successful uh, moving forward in this world that is constantly changing. Why do things need to be that way? Uh, what if we did it in a slightly different way? Could that be more efficient for people? Like this is the kind of disruption that I would love to see. Um, I often say that what you want is not to be the person whose work is mitigated and managed by the AI of Upwork or Fiverr. You want to be the person who's making the next Upwork or the next Fiverr, who is creating, who is doing the disrupting. And I think we have um, good examples of that in Canada. Like we have some really great companies um, that, like Benevity, that's kind of challenging the notion of like corporate social responsibility and how they, they can do giving. Um, and I think that we we have this in Alberta. So it's something that I would love to, to see continued and potentially solidified as something we care about this, something that is a priority. It's, it's a future skill that we need. The next one is communication. Okay, so what do I mean by communication? A lot of people think like uh, this is just, I don't know, being able to write essays. Um, it's not. Uh, it, this is really focused on being able to sell <laughs> like communication to me and selling communication and selling are, are basically the same thing uh, in from my perspective, because you're always in an environment where you're going to need to convince somebody. So even if you're a researcher, you need to convince other researchers that your idea, like ideas are competitive. And often the idea that is communicated better is going to be the one that is going to win. And so if you can understand communication, you can understand where, um, what are the things that people are looking for? How can we interrupt patterns, you know, so that it doesn't seem like, oh, just another thing that I'm going to scroll through. How do we stop that thumb? <laughs> um, you know, the same kind of things that digital marketers use. Um, is a really basic skill uh, that I think everyone should have some understanding of because that is something that I did notice as well um, in even in working in tech is that the level of technical expertise is high for everyone. Like you, you don't get in unless you have some level of technical expertise, but the, the communication skill between individuals and I think people also refer to emotional intelligence as a type of communication skill. It is, right? It's your ability to tap in to people's like actual pains, their fears, those types of things that causes people to be very successful. Um, so uh, examples would be like one sentence persuasion would be um, like kind of what they use in tabloids and, and copywriting. Those types of skills I think are very important no matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you're writing for science. Like, I think some people see it as, oh, I, I would never do this because it, it feels like I'm trying to like, like be a salesperson. Um, and 
to a certain extent, it is like the most successful. I think uh, Derek from Veritasium, he says that the most successful thumbnails are the ones that are like as close to clickbait, but just not clickbait. Um, and it's because those clickbaity titles actually are what people want. Like they they are meeting a need, same as the tabloids. The tabloids are telling people information that they want. It's not true, right? They're going to switch it with something else. Um, but that's why people click on it. So if we can understand a little bit of what's going on there. I think that our, our kids are going to have a much better success at just any any aspect of their lives. So the next one is citizenship. We've already talked about digital citizenship 2.0. Um, that's a, a lot of the topics that we're covering in here today. But I want to also talk a little bit more um, about what, what citizenship means. It's like dual citizenship, right? We all have this dual citizenship now of you are both a citizen of the local place where you live, but you're also a citizen online these days. These two are potentially different, right? There are people who are very active in the online space and they're not very active locally and then vice versa. Uh, and those two are starting to merge. Uh, and what I mean by that is they are starting to become um, closer. Your activism is going online. Like people are, are writing about uh, issues that they really care about um, online. They are communicating online uh, more and more. So it's kind of a reflection of what's going on um, in their own lives and in their society. And it's a reflection of what's important to them. But at the same time, they're so different <laughs> because being a citizen on a online space is is completely different. It, it's almost like each company that you go with is like a totally different country. Um, you could imagine like Google is like a country that you could be a citizen of. of. Facebook is a different like Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. That's like another country that you could you could be a part of. You can give your data to. And so in those types of environments, you have to understand that the rules are different. What does voting in those societies mean? It's really just your data. Like, where are you going to send your data? Am I going to send my data to, to this platform or to, to another platform? You, you can choose where you want to send that data. And so that's a big part of citizenship is voting um, and having the rights to vote. And so understanding the connection between your digital footprint, your digital identity, yes, there are some concerns, but... There are ways you can fight back. You don't have to just say, like, oh, I'm not going to give my data to anyone. You can say, like, I'm not going to give my data to this company whose values I don't agree with. That can be the equivalent of saying, I'm not going to vote for this party that whose values I do not agree with. So it gives you new power as a digital citizen. And I think us and our ability to control that, um, we decide what goes online. And we can think about it from the perspective of, oh, like people might use this against us. It's certainly possible. But I also think in, in thriving, we have to decide. We have to make decisions about like, where are we going to send our data? Um, and, and that's an important, an important distinction and an important decision that we, we need to make. And so it's, it's another part of citizenship that I'm hoping we will expand upon a lot more. Uh, you want to learn more about that, like algorithms of oppression, weapons of mass destruction are good ones. Um, and of course, AI superpowers are, are good books to cover on that. The last one that I want to cover is called character. Okay, so what do I mean by character? So this one is one that I think is increasingly important, uh, especially coming back to school there is going to be wider and wider gaps. We call them divides, right? Like there's going to be an education divide or an education gap uh, between some students who have had a lot of support at home and then maybe some students that have not had the same level of support. And so what can we do um, to close or to bridge these gaps? And a lot of that has to do with the character aspect. And this skill is a life skill that it's critical. Um, it's a future-ready skill that we absolutely need. And the reason I describe this is because despite us being super 
connected. You know, we have all these online systems. We could like call people anytime. We could like, you know, they they invite us to all sorts of online chats. You can speak with people anytime. We we all can also feel very alone and isolated. And as a result, we, we can spend a lot of time in our own thoughts, and that can cause um, depression. It can make us like feel about like judging ourselves and each other, um, and it can lead to a lot of challenging things. And so our sense of self, our sense of character, our, our feelings uh, around what we can and we cannot control is going to have a big impact on how happy we are <laughs> moving forward. And this, this matters, right? Because how happy we are is going to determine what we... It's going to determine our outcomes. It's going to determine our outlook on life. It affects everything. And our AI algorithms are already targeting things like our unconscious. And I think in the same way, we need to be considering our own mental health from that perspective as well. So I've been talking about, like, what do we know about, like, what do we teach our children about detoxing their news feed, right? Like, how do we tell them, like, this is how you get rid of all that negative news that you see all the time that is totally affecting your mood, right? And it's totally making you think in a particular way. We think that these these subtle images or what what have you online are not going to impact us. But they do. They do. Marketers know this. Otherwise, why would they have like a big billboard, you know, that, that shows something? It's because they know you may not be paying attention to it, but your unconscious mind is processing lots and lots of stuff all at the same time. And so that is, that's going to affect you. That's going to have an impact on what your mood is. It's going to impact your emotions. I mean, Facebook did this, right? Like they, they were on the news for this. They um, did an experiment where they started posting more positive um, messages and they, they found, oh, I can like totally affect people's moods. I can make them happier. Like I, we can make like certain uh, posts that they have more positive as a result. And so they they know that these kind of things can have a big impact on us. It's already been well established and uh, proven. But really, for for us, this notion of character, we talk about um, grit and resilience. And we also talk about social, emotional, and wellness. Um, those aspects will become more and more important because those are the foundations. You don't have those aspects you can forget about like school and, and catching up or academic success. Um, it's not going to happen, right? Like what we have these days is not a, uh, like a crisis of academic performance. What we have is a crisis of confidence. And what this means is that just people, they feel worthless. They feel like they can't do anything. They cannot achieve. And to me, that is frightening. An entire generation of our kids, like we, oh man, when I was a school council chair um, at Bus and Marie Rose, like you would see the, they had like student self-selection surveys and kind of anxiety, student anxiety goes up, 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 kind of on a linear path. And then grade eight, it goes up exponentially because grade eight, is when you become 13 years of age. You become effectively an adult on the internet. And now your entire world, like a lot of what your thoughts th that occupy your mind, uh, are managed and mitigated by social media. And so if you felt inadequate before, just wait until you have social media, and then they're only showing you the most popular posts out there of people that you may not even may not even be in your class they might not even be your peers they might just be like influencers um and having those critical discussions of like oh what does it mean to like to be one of these influencers and is it is that really what their life is really all like um we don't have enough of those conversations and so as a result people have way more anxiety They're, they really feel like oh like i i don't belong or they feel like, I, I can't make it. And I think that that's really, really unfortunate. Um, and I think that there are a lot of things that we can do. 
Uh, it's one of the reasons why I uh, created the AI parenting uh, community was to help families move from screen time, which is a big concern, to quality time. And we're doing that by first not sedating, right? Not using it for sedation, but using it for relating. So relating to their interests, trying to show an interest in their interests, caring about them and believing in them. Um, and and I'll, I'll also add, like, the one of the reasons why this is important to me and, like, one of the reasons why I'm, like, applying to be a trustee was because when I was was young, uh, like as a an individual growing up with ADHD, undiagnosed, uh, school was not easy for me. I did really poorly <laughs> in school as probably like that 60s student, you know, barely passing. Uh, and I do remember um, my parents saying, you know, like, even if I got, like, really low grades, like 60s, um, they would always say, like, look at that one thing that you did really well. That is so amazing. I am so proud of you. And it's it's so different. Like, the way that I was raised is so different from many Asian families where they're like, where, how come you're not getting this higher grade? Like, I am so disappointed in you, right? Like, you you need to be able to get A's all the time. And I never grew up with that. Uh, it was the case that my parents kept encouraging me and they kept saying positive things, kept finding like in all the bad things that I did, they would find that one, that one good thing that, that I was able to accomplish. So they kept believing in me. They kept, you know, um, complimenting me and, and giving me the, that, that positive energy until I started to believe it myself, right? Like, I didn't feel confident. I felt like trash, you know? I didn't feel like I was performing relative to my peers. Um, people were way better than me in school. They were able to pick up things way quicker than, you know, probably you know, didn't have to deal with like ADHD and dyslexia. Um, you know, all of these things that was hard for me, like reading books, reading books, even today is hard for me. Most of these things that I'm sharing with you today, they, they come from audiobooks that I've listened to, right? Like these are like adaptations that I've, I've grown up with as an adult. And so to me, this is very important, right? It's important to this believing in our kids before they believe in themselves is very important. And we can change people's outlook on their life if we build up the confidence and the character in kids. I know this is true because it happened for me. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I work in education. It's one of the reasons why I want to give back what had first been given to me. Uh, like, I want to pay forward um, this kind of master class <laughs> I had in positive parenting that happened before positive parenting existed, just because I had positive parents. I had um, positive teachers as well, right here in Calgary. Um, as somebody who's like, born and raised Calgarian, I've, I've lived here my entire life, I can say that there are some amazing teachers <laughs> in our public and separate systems. It's, it's incredible. We, we need to give them the opportunity to, to shine and to, to be the types of role models that we need them to be.